stand together tonight. Lord Jesus, we love you. And again, Father God, we invite you to come and move among us. Come and do what you would want to do in this place, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. We want you to move and do whatever it is you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
there's no one like our God. No one can defeat him. No one can stand above him. There is no one that compares to him. He's the mighty God. Declare the truth of the Lord today. In this place, let's worship the Lord together. Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify your name today, Lord. We glorify your name today, Jesus. You are mighty. You are awesome. Holy and worthy are you, Lord. Holy and worthy.
us for whining and complaining when it's hard, when it's not easy. And God, help us to embrace the trial. God, just like you spoke last night in the fire, that's when you burn away the other stuff, God. In the trial, that's when you can bring new things out in us, God.
worship you, Lord. Let's lift our voices to him tonight. You are great and you are mighty, God. We worship you, Jesus. God bless you guys. Y'all are frisky. Did I say sit down? Come on, everybody. Stand up one more time. Hey, Simon, do not say sit down. Come on. <laughs> and my name isn't even Simon. Everybody raise your right hand. Everybody keep your eyes open. The Bible says watch and pray. Amen. <laughs> say this with me. Jesus, Jesus. Help, me help me to never, 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 never. forget yeah. what I'm going to learn tonight. Help me to apply it. And go seek somebody for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands like you mean it. Come on. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I was going to make you stand up again. Whoa. Oh, you young folk wanted to sit down. Amen. If you, got, if you have your Bible, would you please open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, please. In the name of Jesus. My wife, Carol, says hi. So hi from my wife, Carol. You know, guys, you guys have crazy weather here in Kansas. I tell you what, you need to cast the demon of that weather out of here. Amen. I cannot believe. I mean, man, it was rather nice. When I planned on, you know, coming here, you know, because, you know, we check out those weather apps and all the rest. This isn't even close to what the weather app said a week ago. You know, I mean, my goodness, I tell you what, it's enough to drive a Baptist to pray in tongues. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Luke chapter 10, please, starting with verse 38. It says this. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha, everyone say Martha, welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, everyone say Mary, but she was not quite contrary. She actually loved the Lord, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations that had to be made. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. Everyone say, tell her to help me. Uh, but the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Can I get an amen? amen. How many of you have ever in your entire lives heard a message on Martha? <laughs> Come on, raise your hand. You know, you heard it, right? I mean, I think personally Martha gets a bum rap, all right? I, I, lo I love Martha, and uh, Martha was probably hyper like me. And um, I think, you know, Martha gets a seriously bum rap in this life. Because Martha's issue here is, I think, she's in a bit of a conundrum. And I think a lot of people just, you know, basically jump on the bandwagon of heaping a whole bunch on this lady. And I think they miss something. And now, there's, there's no doubt that there's something wrong. Well, can I explain this a little bit to you from my perspective? Can I? You know what, I mean, this is somewhat of an apologetic for this girl. I mean, because, you know, everybody just disses her, and I just think, you know, you just got to look at it in perspective. Amen? All right? So, uh, first off, it was no coincidence that Jesus came to their house. How many of you want Jesus coming to your house? 
You know what, man? I tell you what, we get people coming over all the time. Every place we've ever lived, we have anointed the walls with oil. We have prayed like mad in tongues over it. A- anybody ever do that with your own house? You know, how many of you ever walked in your house and thought a demon was in there? I'm not talking about your kids either. Come on, somebody. You know, have you ever felt, well, you know what? Did you ever occur to you that maybe you ought to pray through your house? Set it aside and dedicate it for the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We have done that in every place that we've lived, and we have never lived in a place where somebody didn't get saved, filled, you know, healed, or a demon come out, and I mean all of those things in our house. We have baptized people in our bathtubs. Amen. I have a swipe, I've always believed God for one of those jetted tubs to make it like the pool of Bethesda. Amen. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that your, your home should be a place where Jesus wants to live. Can I get an Amen. You know what? You know what happens? I mean, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're unclean or clean. And I'm not talking about, like, religiously. I'm talking about whether you keep your house in order or not. You know that if somebody's coming over, what's the first thing everybody does? Then you clean the house. In this case, you're pointing at <laughs> He's pointing at And that's why you guys are packing up and moving apart from each other. But anyway, here, I mean, the bottom line here is, is that, you know what? Uh, uh, you're going to clean up. Even if you're not that clean of a person, you're going to find a few rooms, dump everything in those rooms, and then make those rooms off limit to people. Am I right? Yes or no? Right? And so you're going to do that because you want to make it look, you know, hospitable for people. Well, when Jesus is coming over, you want to make sure it's hospitable for the Lord. Can I get an amen? You know what? You're, since he lives in you and you're the house of the Lord, you need to be hospitable for him so he can come in and reside in you in a nice place. So you know what? That's why we clean, you know, want to get people cleaned up on the inside so they look better on the outside. Can I get an amen to that? But you know what? It's true also that we need to do that with our homes. There's stuff in our homes that Jesus doesn't think we see, but he sees them. Oh, that's good preaching right there. But I want you to hear this, okay? Because that's just kind of a little bit, mini of a tangent. Jesus, it was no accident that he went to Mary and Martha's house. Mary and Martha had a brother. Let's test people's biblical knowledge. Who was Mary and Martha's brother, little brother? That's right, Lazarus, right? Not the Lazarus and the rich guy guy who was poor outside and all the rest and died. And, you know, he went to Abraham's bosom. But Lazarus, who gets raised from the? Right. So Lazarus, so that's their brother. Now, we know, if you read the Gospels, that Jesus loved this family. I mean, he loved them. He really cared for them. In fact, even in his rebuke of Martha, you could tell how much he loves them. Because instead of saying, woman, you sinned. And you need to do this. He goes, oh, Martha, Martha. Which in those days, and even in certain other cultures like my own, that, that, that when you use that expression, it's an endearing expression where someone is gently correcting somebody else that they love very much. And so he showed up because he loved them. Now I want, peop- I, I want you all to know this. Jesus loves you. He wants to show up. If you're ever going to do a really fun study, look at everybody who ever invited Jesus to come to their house and see how, see if he ever said no to anybody. If you invite him, he'll come. I said if you invite him, he'll come. Which means if he ain't there, maybe there's something he can't dwell with. Amen? You know, we always have prayed over our homes. God, make our place a, our home a home of healing and salvation and all the rest. Jesus, find a place that you can reside in. That, Lord God, people can find you and, 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 and seek you. You know, when people come over to our place, I mean, we have a hard time getting them out. Amen? I mean, everybody wants to stay there. They just start lounging back. They love the presence of God. They want to know what the ambiance is and all the rest. And we tell them, well, that's Jesus that you're feeling, the Holy Spirit that you're feeling. Now, true, when we all get to yelling in tongues for a while, maybe some people want to leave early. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, we're, you know it's the presence of God. Can I get an amen? Well, Jesus wanted to show up. So he's not just by accident going to their home. He's targeted it, and this is the people that he loves. And so he shows up at this place. Now, this is going to be important for you to know, so I want to kind of give you a little bit of uh, some uh, foreknowledge before you kind of get into the the main point here uh, as we kind of tell this story um, so that we all kind of get the main point. Um, And here's this, okay? So eventually what's going to happen after this event where he shows up at their house, you know, Jesus is going to hear that Lazarus, the little brother of the house, who obviously wasn't there when he visited, uh, that Lazarus, the little brother, he got sick and he was deathly ill and he was going to die. And so Jesus finds out about it because he's in another place doing ministry. 
And so they tell him that in hopes that he's going to show up. And then Jesus says to his disciples, Lazarus, you know, is sick. And basically, Jesus doesn't go anywhere, and he stays until Lazarus actually dies. Now, that sounds horrible, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you're a friend and you find out somebody's deathly ill, and you delay your going saying, I'm not going to show up until he's actually dead. Now, you know what? I, a little aside here. I'm a little off kilter. I mean, I don't know if you figured that out, <laughs> right? That's why I hang out with Ron, because he's been, you know, licensed to be able to manage me. But anyway, so here's this, all right? Um, uh, he's like a zookeeper. It's a zookeeper thing, I think you got. But anyway, so, so, I mean, the point is, is that I'm a little off kilter. And I mean, I'm... I get jazzed up at that thought. I mean, to me, it sounds like an awesome thing to basically, you know, uh, be the kind of person who wants to wait until somebody's good and sick or good and dead so you could show up and then raise them from the dead. I mean, you know, when the Bible says that we can, and this is the truth, we can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils, I mean, my goodness, isn't that exciting? We can actually heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils. I mean, it puts a whole new perspective on if you're bored for the weekend, what you get to go do. Amen. Right? I mean, because, like, if you're bored and you don't know what to do and the family's all deciding or you and your friends like, what do we do? Ah, we did that last month or ah, well, who knows or whatever. Hey, dress up, go driving around, find what funeral home has got a funeral going on and go visit the funeral. Amen? You know, go up there, sign the book, put in a Bible verse. You know, nobody knows everybody who's ever shows up at a funeral anyway. So, you know, sign the book, get a Bible verse, they'll read it afterwards. And then whoever's turn it is that week, you know, you just walk up, you know, to the casket, you know, to pay your respects. And whoever's turn it is, you know, show up as a group, you know, three or four of you. Show up, look, you know, somberly at that person in the casket. Get your hands on the dead guy. And whoever's turn it is, just pray while everybody else is praying in tongues. You pray and say, in the name of Jesus, get up now. Amen. You know, if the person doesn't get up, well, then just go eat the free food afterwards. But if they get up, start preaching. Amen? <laughs> I mean, to me, this is what we're, you can't raise a dead guy unless you're praying for a dead guy. Did it ever occur to anybody? How are you going to get anybody healed if you don't pray for somebody who's sick? Am I making sense? How are you going to raise the dead unless you pray for somebody who's dead? Amen? So Jesus waits, and the guy dies. All right? Lazarus dies. Then Jesus tells his disciples, Lazarus is asleep. And his disciples, who are some of the more doofus people that you're ever going to meet on the planet, they say, well, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. <laughs> now, it's interesting because the term that he used would have been understood in their day as having died. But, you know, how many of you have ever read and heard the disciples, the apostles, say things, and you feel like, man, there actually is hope for me? Anybody? <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. And so, so, I mean, that is encouraging to me that God could use anybody. And so, so uh, then Jesus says plainly to them, he's dead. And I'm glad so, for so because, you know, he's basically going to use this as a teaching point for them. And so he goes, so we're going to go there. And the disciples who still don't get the point say, well, let's go and die with him. I was like, Oy vey, Ishmael, I cannot believe that this is what you're doing. So anyway, so they show up and as they're on their way, uh, something happens. Uh, something happens, somebody comes out because they're told in the house that Jesus is on the way. And Martha is the one who comes out to meet him because we're seeing some of these tendencies that are in Martha here in this text. Martha comes out probably in the same way that she's prepping for Jesus here. Remember, she was busy with the preparations. That if you read this in some of the other uh, Gospels, if you read the story and read about this, you know, she was making ready things that needed to be made ready. In other words, when somebody comes to your house, you need to present them with something. You need to feed them. You need to put, like, something in front of them. You know, get them a Coke, get them some meal. Uh, am I making sense? Amen? You know, and then this is important that we're all on the same page here. You know, when you're Greek, my, uh, you know, I was raised that if people come to your house, you're supposed to stuff them full until they're ready to puke and send them home with a week's worth of leftovers. So when people come to my house, you're going to get fed. Amen? Right? You know, and I said the other day, you don't eat meat, it's okay, I make you lamb. I mean, I don't make you lamb. I'm, I'm going to cook for you and I'm going to send you home with stuff. All right? All right? I was raised with that. Cultures around the world were raised with that. In America, America used to be like that. I mean, but somehow we've kind of changed, and now people are lucky if they could get from your porch into your front door. I mean, you know, and, and that's people that you know. <laughs> you know, why did you show up at my house? I didn't invite you. <laughs> you know, you come to my house, you're always going to eat. So if you're ever visiting Denver, I probably won't be there, but hey, come on over. All right, here are this. All right. The point is, is that, you know, you know, she is concerned about prepping things for people, and that's what was going on in this text that we read here. 
in Luke chapter 10. But in John chapter 11, where this whole story is of Lazarus, she's also concerned, so she goes out to meet Jesus. And my thought is, she wants to find out how many of his homies in them are all going to show up so she can feed them, you know, for the funeral luncheon. All right, so, so she goes out there and she says to Jesus, everybody listen to me, she says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Now, is that a true story, yes or no? Is that a true statement, yes or no? Yeah, because Jesus could heal anything. I don't care what disease you got, he could heal it. Doctors gave up on me, they gave up on me. They told me six years ago, I think it's now going on six years ago, I only had a year to live. It seems like I'm doing pretty good, huh? <laughs> and I'm not taking any medication. I'm not doing anything. I am trusting Jesus. So I'd be an idiot if I told you, if, if I didn't tell you that Jesus heals everybody because you're looking at a miracle standing right in front of you. All right? So you know what? I mean, Jesus heals. And he certainly could have healed Lazarus. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Right? So he could heal him. Now follow this, okay? So she shows up, right? And she tells him, if you'd been here, he, he would not have died. But even now I know. Oh, this sounds good, right? Even now I know that whatever you ask of the Father, he'll do it. That's a radical faith statement right there, huh? Right? I mean, right? Is that a rat? Come on, talk to me. Is that a rat statement, yes or no? Right, rat statement. So she says this rat statement. She's trusting God and all the rest. She says that, right? And, uh, and Jesus says, well, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if they die. And do you believe this? She asks him. I mean, he asks her. And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that my brother shall be raised from the dead in that day, the resurrection of the dead day. Now here's what's funny. Jesus is telling her this so that she, you know, he's revealing his will that he wants to raise her little brother who's dead from the dead. And he's telling her, on the resurrection of life, anybody who believes in me shall live even if they die. And, and he's basically revealing to her that he wants to raise him from the dead because that's his application, because that's what happens at the end of that chapter. I mean, you know, as you go on. So he's telling her, this is what I'm going to do. And she says, I know it's going to happen, but it's going to happen later on when we're all dead. And then you come back, basically, and, and we're going to be raised from the dead. The resurrection of the righteous. Are you following with me? You know what, that's kind of what a problem is, even in this room, and why we need to walk in the Spirit a lot more than we ever have. Because we all believe that God can do anything, but we don't believe that he actually will in real time. Now, you know what's really funny? And you've got to read this in, in John chapter 11, because it's like so totally awesome. It's awesome. When you read this in John chapter 11, okay, Martha says this to Jesus. He's prodding her to understand that he's talking about, I'm here to raise him from the dead. And Martha says, I know it'll happen in the end after he's been dead for a while. It's kind of like the people in this room who say, well, you know what? Yes, God heals, but sometimes death is the perfect healing. Now, I want to tell you something. Death is death. It is not a healing. The problem you have is that you think death is somehow a failure. Death is a glorious entrance into a reward where God is giving a faithful servant their reward. And they're having, those that have died in Christ, are having a better day than you and I are having. Can I get an amen? Death is not a healing. And, and if you believe that, it's cool. You can believe whatever you want to believe. You're still wrong. But the bottom line is, right? You know, death is not a healing. And if you believe that, I actually don't want you to pray for me to be healed of anything because I'm not exactly sure what it is you're asking God to do. If you believe death is a healing, you're going, God, heal him. It's like, I don't want to die. Okay, <laughs> amen. Hear this, all right? The point here is, and I want you all to get this, is that Martha basically says and doesn't believe in real time that Jesus is going to do what he's saying because your faith is actually pretty small. And, but she says the right things. She doesn't have the right things. She professes much, but possesses little. And so she says this. Then she goes back to her house and tells Mary, her sister, who's in this story that I just read to you, hey, the Lord's asking for you. And then Mary shows up, throws herself at Jesus' feet. That's kind of weird because that's like in this text that I just read you here. Throws herself at Jesus' feet. And says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She says the same thing Martha did. But in this case, something different happens. See, this is why you need to read your Bible carefully. Because 
she says the same thing her sister did to start with. But you know what's interesting, and nobody ever notices this? When she goes to go find Jesus, after Martha comes back to the house saying that Jesus is looking for her, if you read it in your Bible, and I really encourage you to do this, you will find out that Jesus had never moved. He was in exactly the same place that Martha had left him, not in their house or at the gravesite. In other words, Martha loved the Lord, but the problem was she didn't have faith that could move the Lord to do anything. You know what, a lot of us come to church and we have this love for Jesus. I mean, we love him, but we don't have faith that he like actually, you know, we don't actually move the Lord to do anything in terms of answering to our prayers. Because our faith is small. Again, like I tell you, we love him. You know, this is what makes this difficult, what I'm kind of trying to communicate to you here, is that it's got nothing to do with whether you love Jesus or not, but it's got everything to do with whether you believe he actually can do something in real time. I mean, you have to understand, I stand on stages all over the planet and say, bring me your sick, your dead, and your demon-possessed because you've prayed to the, your, your false gods all your life and never once have your false gods answered your prayers. I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's going to hear my prayer, heal your sick, raise your dead, and cast out your devils. And he's going to do it to prove to you Jesus is the one true and only God and the only way to get to heaven. And for 34 years... Uh, for 30, yeah, well, 33, yeah, well, 34, 30, oh man, I'm old. 34 years of ministry, Jesus has answered my prayer in front of everybody. And that's why we plant churches in a lot of places. Listen, man, even in Europe where God is doing stuff. I mean, I was in uh, Brussels, Belgium. I did two, I, I've done three ministry trips. I'm going there again here in a little while. But I, 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 uh, I've done two ministry trips, by the way, in the land of heavenly chocolates. Can I just get an amen from somebody? <laughs> Amen. We were having a deep, heavy, revelational discussion at lunch today. I mean, on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light and let there be dark. Could it be light chocolate and dark chocolate? <laughs> or is it light roast or dark roast for coffee? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but hear this. I mean, this is just my own revelation. But hear this. Okay. The thing is, is that you know, guys, I was preaching there. So I preached the first time. We had all these awesome things happen. They had me come again. Like, it wasn't even like seven months later. And seven months later, I show up again to preach. And, and my interpreter, who's, a, who's a, a Frenchman from France, looks at me. He goes, Brother Dean, because they have these great accents. Brother Dean, I, I need to tell you a testimony before we get up and preach. And I said, sure, tell me. But we're going to be up there in five minutes, so tell me quick. And so he looks at me. He goes, well, he, he goes, do you remember when you were here seven months ago? And I said, yes. He says, do you remember, you walked out of one of the meetings and we brought you to a room that was outside because there was a man who was acting crazy. <laughs> and I said, sure. I mean, the way they talk is great with their accent. And, and, I, and I'm like, oh, mais oui, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho, crepes was that, give me a croissant, ho, oh, oh. All right. So anyway, so, um, so, you know, he says, I sound like Pepe Le Pew. I don't know why. I just like sound like, but, but, and I look like him too. But anyway, hear this. All right, so, so, um, so I said, yes. I said, so, so what? He goes, well, that man was from my church in France. These people that come all the way from France, from where I'm from, from the church I am from, and they came. I said, well, praise the Lord. He goes, no, 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 that is not the testimony. He goes, I, he goes they have brought the man, and do you remember, he was on the ground, and he was thrashing around, and they asked you to pray for his eyes because he could not see. And I remembered the story. Okay, look, I do so much. I'm so busy all the time. But, but I remember this, and the reason why is because they brought me out of the room and said, can you pray for that guy? He's in this other room because he's having some problems. When I walked in, the guy was being held down by several people, and he's thrashing around on the ground like this. And they said, he has a hard time seeing. He can't see. Can you pray for his eyes? That would just struck me as weird. The guy is... <laughs> acting like he's demon possessed and they want me to pray for his eyes <laughs> right and I didn't feel there was a demon they didn't ask me to pray for a demon and so I leaned down and I uttered one prayer because he was thrashing about and I needed to get back in the room because there were hundreds of people in the room and things were happening and so I I I, I kneeled down put my hand on his head as his head was you know going all over the place and I said oh God visit him and give him everything that he needs amen that's a horribly pathetic general prayer, but that's what I prayed. I mean, that's what kind of came out of me, right? So, so then I said, I'm sorry you have to go, and I zipped back into the room, okay? So I did that. He goes, do you remember him? And I said, yes, I remember him. He goes, well, that man was from my church. I said, praise God. You know, and he goes, no, 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 that is not the testimony. 
And I said, well, what's the testimony? We got to get up here soon. And he said, he goes, oh, he goes, is that man, they brought them from my church in France. I said, you said that already. And he said, but they brought them from my church in, in, in France. And he said, they visited. And, you know, he was always violent this way because he had mental illness. And he had all these other things. And, and, and uh, the next morning, he was sleeping so peacefully that the people who brought him, they were able to come to the morning service uh, without having him there. And someone watched him. And then they went back and they, they picked him up and they brought him back to France. I said, well, praise God for safe travel. He goes, that is not the testimony. <laughs> And he said, we were, it was like one of the craziest discussions I've ever had with somebody. And, and I'm like, well, what's the testimony, All right? And he said, well, he said, uh, uh, when they came back to the room, the, the, this, this man, because they left somebody to watch him, you know, and he was sleeping so peacefully. And so when they came back after the, the meeting, they walked into the room where they were all staying. And he was sitting in a corner with a Bible open, and he was reading the Bible. And I looked at him and I said, this is how stupid I am, okay? I looked at him and I said, but I thought you said he couldn't see. <laughs> how dumb is that? <laughs> I said, I thought you said he couldn't see. He says, may we? I mean, the, uh, the Lord, uh, he healed him. He, he, he actually said it. He healed him. <laughs> I'm like, he got an eel? What, you know, I mean, he healed him. You know, it's great when you're talking to people with accents. It's just awesome. And so, so uh, he goes, he, he was healed. I said, he was what? <laughs> he goes, healed. I said, oh, you mean, I mean, he was healed. He goes, wait, 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 wait. I will tell you what happened. He goes, they walked in and they were shocked. I mean, the way he said shocked, I didn't understand that's what they were saying, but that's what they were saying. Uh, um, he, yeah, they were shocked. I said they were what? He's a shocked. And I thought he was saying they were chocolate. <laughs> they weren't real people. They were made out of chocolate. <laughs> I mean, um, and so, so yeah, they, were, they, were, they were shocked. And they said, what, what are you doing? Listen, what are you doing? And he said, I am reading the Bible. And he goes, but how is this possible? How, you, you, you are in your right mind. How, how is this possible? And he said, Do I, I don't know. I, I was sleeping so peacefully. And I woke up. And you were gone. But the man was sitting at the foot of my bed. And the man said, I've come to visit you and give you everything that you need. Rise from your bed. I have made you well. And then he walked out to the room. <laughs> Are you hearing what I just said to you? You try to get up after somebody tells you that. Right when they turn to you and say, get up and preach. <laughs> right? I, I'm looking at it, and I'm going, what? <laughs> Jesus visited this guy. He is in his right mind. God heals any disease. He even heals mental disease. God healed his mind, healed his eyes. He is working a regular job. This young man told me their church has exploded with growth because all the people in that area knew him. And so when he got back to France, the miracle that has happened in his life has caused that church to explode with growth. Can somebody shout amen? amen. God doesn't just can. He does. It's not just, I feel like I'm channeling Yoda right now. I mean, <laughs> do not try. Do. <laughs> I mean, listen to me, okay? The truth is, my, my dear friends, my dear family, I want you to know God not, doesn't just, it's not that he can do something. He will do something, and he'll do it right now. Whether that's filling people with the Holy Spirit, whether it's saving people, whether it's delivering them from demons, God is going to do it. So he says that, right? Jesus Jesus isn't moved by Martha, even though he loves her. He's moved by Mary. Now listen to me. In John 11, you've got to read John 11. Mary, okay, Mary throws herself at his feet, just like in what we just read in Luke 10. Mary throws himself, prostrate. She seems like she just can't even stand. She just kind of gets in that worship position. And said, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus gets so moved, he goes right to the tomb where the miracle happens. She moves Jesus Martha doesn't. When he gets to the tomb, if you remember the story, for especially those of you who read the King James, because it's the greatest verse in the Bible in the King James, Jesus says, roll away the stone. And somebody pipes up and says, Lord, he's been dead for like four days. And if you do this in the King James, how does it say it? Go ahead, say it, bro. He stinketh. I mean, come on, that's the easiest verse. That's the easiest verse to memorize in the whole Bible. <laughs> he stinketh. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> right? He stinketh, right? So he says that, right? Um, there are a couple of great verses in the Bible. He stinketh, and Job, when he complains, he says, even my wife finds my breath repulsive. Anyway, 
Um, so uh, there's just a couple of verses that stand out to me. But hear this. <laughs> right. um, he stinketh. Who do you think was telling the Lord that he stinketh? So, you know, you may want to think twice about removing the stone. Who do you think said that? Anybody have a guess? Martha. Martha. The same Martha who couldn't move Jesus. The same Martha who's in the story right here. The same Martha tells Jesus wants the stone. Why do you think he wanted the stone removed? To smell dead potpourri? I mean, seriously, what do you think he's asking the stone to be removed for? Every, you know, we see it, but when Jesus asks, the only person who complains about it is Martha because she's concerned that Jesus is going to smell something that doesn't smell so good. That's basically like the church person who's in this room right now who's more concerned about, well, what about that? There's a person who's a visitor, and I don't want them to feel uncomfortable while God's moving. And so you're the person who spends all your time trying to make them feel comfortable talking, and they're missing out on what God is doing. Am I making a point? You know, the person who's more concerned about, oh my gosh, you know, we got to make sure that the church looks good. Look, I am so grateful that you love your church. I am so grateful that you're concerned about how everything looks, how everything flows, how everything goes, how if the electronics are working great, and oh my gosh, those are not those words to the song. I mean, how do they get, you know, the words to MC Hammer up on the screen? I mean, you know, you know the, the, am I dating myself? Gosh, I'm old. But hear this, right? I mean, the point is, friends, I mean, some of you are more concerned about what's, actually going on the way it's flowing than what God is actually doing in the room. I mean, Martha can't even see what Jesus told her. Jesus literally told her, I'm going to raise him from the dead. I mean, he's basically making a note to her. But she cannot hear it because she's so busy with the minutia of details that have distracted her from the greater good, which is the faith that God wants everybody to have. You know, we're more concerned about everything going right from the beginning to the end of a service. Man, I wish it's like on time. You know, like what, uh, uh, what Ron was sharing about, how about that guy who was speaking on healing and, and then gave that one word at the end of going too long and taking too long and why don't you pray for everybody because people are not going to come back to the next service. I mean, God forbid, if the service goes longer than three hours, you know, after all, nobody's going to come back to that. I mean, it doesn't matter how many people get healed, saved, filled, and delivered. Nobody's going to show up if it's longer than, you know, an hour. You know, you're going to find out that if God's in the room, people will show up and they'll drive an hour and a half in one direction to get there. Because people are looking for the living God. They're not looking for a dead church. I wouldn't show up at a dead church. Why would I show up at a dead church? Roll away the stone and let Jesus in. You know, there was a church in my, when I'm from Chicago, I mean, you know, my parents are from Greece and they land in Chicago. And so I, I'm from Chicago, born, bred, and raised. And then I live in Denver now. But, but I mean, there was a church, it was, it was a Catholic church. And, and this church, it no longer exists because uh, there's a couple reasons. But it burned to the ground. And most of us believe it was the judgment of God because of what was going on in that church. But, but, the, but the bottom line is, whoever built the statue of Jesus outside of it didn't do a very good job. Because, you know, most of the time when you're at a, and forgive me, I'm going to have to get down to show you. Most of the time, the statues are like this, you know? It's this welcoming thing like, come unto me. But whoever did that statue, it was like this. <laughs> and it really looked like Jesus was saying, don't come in here. <laughs> right? You know, because I'm not here. They're making me freeze outside. I mean, you stay away. Right? I mean, that's literally what it looked like. We all laughed about it in the neighborhood because we're like, look at that. You know what I mean? Even he doesn't want to go. All right? I mean, I mean, the point is, right? The point here is, my friends, is that, you know, we're so concerned about all the stuff, we're basically, we're kind of basically doing the same thing. I mean, we, 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 we don't see Jesus. We're just seeing all the stuff and the minutiae of everything that's going on. And Martha couldn't move Jesus and her, and her you know, her brother Lazarus' is life dependent on it. She's trying to stop him from rolling with the stone because she's honestly concerned. Hey, you know, he's going to smell. You don't really want to smell him. Whatever you need to do, can we just do it outside here where it's nice because other people are here? Am I making sense? I hope I am. Because this is like, whoa, important. <laughs> All right, hear this, okay. But they roll away the stone anyway, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, you know, comes out. I mean, is that cool? That's a great story, right? But I think it's all related to this story. I think the problem can be, we could zone in on it from here. And hopefully this will now make sense. Look at what it says here. It says, Jesus comes to, the, uh, to their home. Yes? Yes? yes. Everybody respond, yes? yes. Right? So, um, so he's talking in their home. Yes? He's preaching the word. He is the word. The word is preaching the word. How cool is that? In the room, right? Right? 
And Martha's busy doing all these other things, but Mary's actually listening to what Jesus is saying, yes? By the way, did it ever occur to you that maybe, just maybe, what Jesus was talking about was the stuff that enabled Mary to move Jesus to go and raise their brother from the dead? We don't know what he was preaching about because we're not told. We just know that he was preaching the word. And somehow she had faith that could move Jesus, but Martha didn't because maybe she wasn't there to hear what he had to say that day. Am I making sense, yes or no? But the thing I want to zoom in on is this. So Mary is so distracted with preparations that actually had to be made. I mean, there was stuff that needed to have been done, all right? There was stuff. I mean, somebody's at your house, you got to do stuff. Yes? I mean, even here, we got to make sure things are clean, that people come in and all the rest. I mean, there's stuff that you should do. Yes? Right? But the stuff is not more important than the one. Am I making sense? In other words, the one that is here is far more important than the stuff is. And if you don't have that priority right, you're in trouble. So if your life is more, you know, uh, uh, predicated on making sure everything is like decent and the uh, protocols are, are followed and all the rest, and that's what you stress about the most, you're going to miss God. Because God is the most important, not protocols. I was speaking to the leaders of the nation of Uganda many years ago, a long time ago. I was speaking to 60 of them. I, I, they, they gathered them together. They were high cabinet level positions. I mean, really high up people in the government. And not the president and his wife, but other people right up there. So they brought me in and they told me, speak to all of them. They, you know, you, we're going to do this Bible study. We want you to reach out to them. So I did. I had this great honor. At the end of the Bible study, I had everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't ask. You know, what the protocol was at the end. Spirit of God rises up inside of me and says, not protocol, altar call. I give an altar call. All of them, every one of them came up to repent and get right with God. I give an altar call for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues. Every one of them got filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. I mean, we are at a massive move of the Spirit of God. It's not about decorum. It's about what God wants. If you're, if you're fixated on decorum because all you're thinking about is, well, after all, this is a high-level person. We need to think about all this stuff. You're going to miss the wonderful opportunities that God has, just like Martha missed out. Now listen to what I'm saying. Martha was busy with preparation that needed to be made, but she didn't have an off switch. You have to have an off switch where somebody can look at you and say, look, you're a little too consumed with all this other stuff. You need to stop. And you need to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and be part of what God is doing spiritually. We need to do that to each other. We desperately need to get each other living in living faith. The time has come for church to be over where nobody moves God and everybody just comes to church and leaves exactly the same way they came. We need to be able to move God. We need to be able to cry out and see Jesus do something. Because we believe that not only he can, but that he will. Listen to me. This is not about playing the stained glass window thing. And you have really interesting ones. <laughs> when the sun came out, I started thinking, I am mildewing. <laughs> um, it's just weird. Okay, now hear this. And please forgive me if one of your relatives died to put those up. I'm so sorry. But hear this. I, I mean. The, the point, you know, I mean, but that's what we have. We have a stained glass window religion where it looks good, but it doesn't do anything. We have so many churches in America. Actually, we have fewer churches than ever before. We have more large churches and fewer people going to church than ever before. How good is that stained glass religion doing in our culture? Not very good, I thinketh. <laughs> Listen to me, okay? Martha, Martha. She's sitting there, and somebody needed to get a hold of her and say, Martha, you're not getting this. You love him. This has got nothing to do with love. She loved him. But Martha, your love is not going to produce faith in you if you don't learn to turn off the switch and realize that earthly things are not your priority. They need to be done. There's an appropriate place for them. But the truth is, you need to learn when to turn it off. Can I get an amen from anybody? Okay, now I want to explain something to you. I want to kind of give you a little bit of an uh, instruction on something. This is Discipleship 101 in the Niforatos household. Do you want to hear it? Yes or no? Yes. Want to hear it? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, the pulpit. Ah, it's a lot of words living and active. See that? Okay, anyway. Um, so so uh, the, 
um, the, the Bible, right? <laughs> the Bible. That was, come on, that was just good. Come on, pound it, girl. Come on, pound it. And splash it. Uh -huh. We baptized that sucker. All right, anyway, so, um, all right, so the, uh, the pulpit represents the church as the spiritual body. Everyone say, that's the church. That's the church. Spiritual, body. spiritual body. All right, and this Bible represents the church's corporate structure. Everyone say, corporate structure. This represents the what? Everybody say spiritual body. Spiritual body. Louder, please. Spiritual body. And this represents the what? Notice the size difference. Okay, size difference. All right, so, so what happens is this is, corp this is the spiritual body. The spiritual body meaning that we're a spiritual body. We live by faith. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. God does things in our midst that cannot be explained by natural man. Amen. You know, prayer is our job. We get after God. He's moving in our midst supernaturally and powerfully. But we also have a what? All together? Louder, please. Corporate structure. Meaning, we, when God speaks to the body, because we live by faith and move by God's leading and guiding as he speaks to us. We also have a corporate structure, meaning that when we pull the resources that God is pouring into this, we pull them together using this so that we can effectively do the things that God's asking us to do. Meaning, we pay bills, we send out missionaries, we make sure people are taken care of, we do hospital visitations, we do all these things that require organization. Am I making sense? Right? So the, the church is a what? What is this? All together. And it also has a what? Here's the problem. The problem is this, which is the what? Is the servant of? That's the way it's supposed to be. We don't, we, you know what the problem is, right? The problem is most of us operate like this. And this is the church many of us were raised in. Where the, all together, is under the domination of the, See, when it's like this, the prayer meeting is the most important. When it's like this, the business meeting is the most important. When it's like this, you know, you're concerned about what God thinks. When you're, it's like this, you're concerned about how people feel about what's going on. When it's like this, it's a theocracy, God rules. When it's like this, it's a democracy and crazy people run. Hmm? Amen. Um, when it's like this... God does miracles and people are rejoicing in the presence of God. When it's like this, who cares about the presence of God? We didn't have as many people this week as we did last week. When it's like this, there are standards. When it's like this, it doesn't matter what the standards are. If people are there, that means it's God. Because it's a corporate mentality. Am I making any kind of sense whatsoever? When it's like this and this, what is this? Rules over this. It's no longer a church. This can move people, but it doesn't move God. This moves God and changes nations. This never has changed a single nation. Ever. This is what produces Pharisees. You know what's so amazing? We actually have cool Pharisees today. I mean, we've got like, I mean, man, they, they dress good. Most of them have goatees. Can I tell you? <laughs> Sorry, bro. Anyway, so, <laughs> no, I mean, hear this, right? They are so cool. They have all the lingo. It's cool. But they're the same as the Pharisees. You know what? Remember when the Pharisees told Jesus, if you want to do miracles, don't do it in God's house. There's an appropriate time to do it. That's when people, not that anybody here has ever heard a new church in America ever say there's a place for tongues and miracles to happen but it's not a church on Sunday oh we believe in that but we do it in a special class now here's the GPS coordinates hope you find it <laughs> you know do you understand what I'm talking about am I speaking truth you better believe I am that's the problem Martha was corporate structure all the way Mary was spiritual and here's the sad thing People who are into this don't think this is necessary, but this is. It's just got to be in the right place. Martha was out of control because she was all of this and missed this. You know what? They, she didn't even know that Mary was a blessing to her because between the two of them, they kind of had this. But, you know, being that the way it's worded makes Martha the oldest, you know, everybody had to obey Martha, which is a bummer because that means this was dominating this. 
And Mary, the spiritual person, was probably like Cinderella. <laughs> you know? I mean, are you following me? Can I show you how bad this gets? Can I? Come on, encourage me, encourage me, encourage me. Because this is like we're on the stretch run. We're about ready to get the gold. Okay, ready? <laughs> All right. All right. So go back to that story here. All right. So it says here, <laughs> it even landed when I dropped it right on the right spot. This is so cool. <laughs> Jesus is so here. Um, look at what it says in verse 40. But Martha was distracted. She was what? With all her preparations, things that had to be done. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do my, all the serving alone? Then tell her to what? Say it again. Tell her to help me. Now, I know that seems like an innocuous comment. But first off, I want to point out the fact. Do you realize what Martha's doing? She's trying to boss the king of the universe around. <laughs> Jesus, using the passive-aggressive, don't you care about me? Look at how hard I'm working. Tell her, Jesus, to help me. Make her help me. Does that sound like anybody hears? Oh, I'm sure it's just me that's gone through this. I'm sure you guys are good. I mean, I, like, was reading this once, and I got so nailed by God because um, this is really bad, but I realized one day I was asking God in prayer. I was saying, God, can you make this person do this? And all of a sudden I realized I'm trying to control the one who's the sovereign, omnipotent magistrate of the universe and get him to be my errand boy to control other people for me. I'm sure nobody, how many of you have ever known somebody who knew somebody who was related to somebody who knew somebody else who ever did that in their prayers? <laughs> you know, you, you know, you realize that's not praying. That's witchcraft, right? That's witchcraft. That's trying to control God so you can, you're trying to control people. Only God has the right, and he doesn't even control us. <laughs> it's easy for me to say that. I mean, you look at Ron, and you're like, well, he's under control. This guy's not under control. <laughs> All right? I want to tell you, the fact is, God doesn't even control people, and yet we're trying to get him and manipulate him to control others for us. Oh my God, this is good preaching right now. Sometimes I'm stupid. I should take another offering right now. Hear this. <laughs> this is what we used to say in my old neighborhood. Preach it and take an offering. That's what we used to say. But anyway, hear this, right? Friends, okay? She's trying to control Jesus. And this is what happens. This is what happens when you're in this kind of a person, family, or church. When it's a corporate structure ruling over the what? It's no longer prayer. It's a series of honey-do lists to God. Take care of this, do this, and do this, and make this happen for me. Because this thinks it knows what the will of God is. This submits to whatever God is doing and what the will of God is. One thinks it knows and goes. This one ever is listening moment by moment. Am I making sense? Here's, here's the thing that's even crazier. Can I tell you the last crazy thing, can I? Can I, can I do it, right? I totally love your hair color. I said that before. But hear this, right? Um, here's the thing, okay? She says, tell her to what? Help. Say it all out. Help. So I got fixated on the word help. I'm looking at it going, okay, it's the word help. What does help mean? It means help, <laughs> right? So I got interested in that word, and so I looked it up because, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the New Testament was written in what language? Say that again. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? <laughs> You know, Jesus came first for the Jew and then for the? Thank you so much. Amen. Although I said that in North Dakota. I was preaching in North Dakota. And a guy came up to me at the end of service. He had a thick accent, which I can't imitate. But he had this thick accent. He goes, young man. He goes, God's favorite people are not from Greece. God's favorite people, according to the Bible, are from Finland. And I looked at him. I said, where is that in the Bible? He goes, our Savior's final words on the cross. It is finished. <laughs> That's just funny. But anyway, <laughs> he just chuckled and walked away. Hear this. <laughs> now listen to me, okay? I looked up the word help. And I looked it up in the Greek in which it was written. And it blew me away. You know, the Greek word that's used there for help is only used in one other spot in the entire Bible. It's used in two places. You want to know where the other place is? In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27. When it says the Holy Spirit helps us with our weakness. The Greek word that's used there is actually very unique in the sense that it is three separate Greek words that have been glued together. It's a compound word. The way we would say it is sina de lavanome is the, is the kind of root word. Sina de lavano. This is, this describes, it's three words. Sin, which means together with, like in an intimate marital relationship. Andi, which you know as the word anti, which means opposed to, but in the ancient Greek, it literally described a raving madman. 
anti, andi, and lamvano, or lamvano me. Lamvano is the Greek word that means uh, to draw out, okay, meaning like, uh, okay, you have a bucket, and it's on a long string, and it's in a well. You are drawing it out until you get to the goal of getting the water. Does that make sense? Right? So, so when Paul was writing to the Romans in Romans 8, 26, 27, describing the work of the Holy Spirit, he was saying the Holy Spirit helps you in your prayers. How does he help you? Well, he's together with you in the most intimate places of your life, seen together. He is raging madman, and he's opposed to every work of the devil and everything that comes against you. Can somebody shout amen? And he's not going to stop lanvanome. He's not going to stop working on you until the job is done, drawing the image of Christ out of you and putting it on the outside. What he's doing on the inside can somebody shout amen. And it's translated in English, helps. <laughs> A little lost in the translation there, I'd say. Right? Now follow this, okay? All right? That word is the same word about how the Holy Spirit helps us in prayer that Martha uses when she's trying to control Jesus and get him to, cha- to get her sister to do whatever she wants her to do. Don't you see? Everybody stand up, please. Everybody stand up. Can you help me out by putting that up there for me? Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Um, everybody stand up. Y'all come to the altar. Come on, everybody come up to the altar. Everybody, come on. Bunch of rascals and rascalettes. <laughs> is that the female version of rascal? <laughs> I'm going to conjugate that verb, that word. I'm going to try to make it into a verb. Come on, everybody come up here. Huh? Amen. We're going to do a couple of things here, but I uh, just want to make sure that we, that I can look at you, spit on air. I love your glasses, dude. I love those. <laughs> um, so, yeah, coming up here, all right? Coming up. Let's all get squishy, all right? Sniff your brothers and sisters in Christ. The family that sweats together and smells together stays together. Hallelujah. All right, now, just everybody up here. Um, just so I can all look at you and say this to you, you know, eye to eye, you know, man to man, man to woman, man to child, uh, man to people who are confused, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, friends, um, I want you to hear this very carefully, okay? If you're a corporate structure person, you profess much but possess little, you know what your prayer life succumbs to and your life succumbs to? You succumb to being a person who's trying to get people to play the role that only the Holy Spirit can play in your life. The church has by far and large ostracized the Holy Spirit from the house that he's the one who's orchestrating and administrating and building it. Jesus said, you cannot do the work that I called you to do apart from being filled with my Holy Spirit. He said that. I didn't say that. He said that. Your issue isn't with me. It's with him. Jesus told his, his, his peeps, he said, you know, I, I want to point out to you that Jesus had died and risen from the dead, had spoken to his disciples, and then had been resurrected and left them, and not a single soul had gotten saved. Not one. But when he pours out the Holy Spirit like he told them that they needed to wait for, and they all got filled with the Holy Spirit praying in other tongues, 3,000 got saved in one day. A chapter later, they're walking to the time of prayer in the house of God. They're walking to the time of prayer when there's a, bl- there's a lame beggar man begging for money, and like good Pentecostals, they were just seriously broke. And so they said, hey, we don't have any silver and gold, but what we do have, we give you. So they gave the guy not what he asked for, but what he needed. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And depending on how you read how that text, either 4,000 more people got saved or 1,000 more got saved to bring the, th- uh, the, the total of men from 3,000 to 4,000. Not bad for a couple of days worth of work. The church was birthed on that day through the miraculous power of the Spirit of God moving when a bunch of people got the help of the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do and they didn't rely on their own. What did they do before they received the Holy Spirit? They said, well, we've got to get another. We had a 12 of us. The one guy's dead. That makes only 11. We better fill that other position, so let's draw lots. That's what, you know what that is, guys? That's Martha. That's this. That's what they did. They get filled with the Holy Spirit and became this. And thousands are getting saved. And as you read in the, in the text in Acts, people are getting saved every day. The church, they, God was adding to their numbers every single day. God keeps growing his church when it's this. But when it's like this, we try to accomplish God's work our way. And it doesn't work. We could fill a house, but we don't move God. That's why... Can I get down and dirty and say something? Because I get to leave, so that's okay, right? (laughs) I want to say this. 
Think about all the communities that are out there that have huge megachurches. I think about Houston. I mean, Houston's got so many megachurches, it's not even funny. It's the world's largest flat city ever, right? <laughs> Houston has got all these megachurches. They're not overtly spirit-filled churches, but they're huge megachurches, right? Mega. I mean, thousands. I mean, supposedly the largest church, you know, uh, in our country is, uh, you know, is there, and it's 24,000, 25,000 people. Yet they voted in a lady who was a lesbian to be the mayor. How's that possible if so many people are actually walking with God? We had some huge churches in Denver, the largest church in Colorado, the largest, absolute largest one in Colorado, bar none. Pastor said, hey, if it's legal, it's moral, weed's fine. I can't picture Jesus ever getting on anybody for smoking weed. He was this close to saying Jesus would be smoking weed with you. He'll be saying that. We had another huge church, an evangelical strong one, the pastors, one, they just became gay affirming. And you're like, why are you picking? I'm not picking on great people. I'm just I'm telling you this is what's going on. These issues are overtly, I want to see people delivered and saved from the ungodliness. I was involved with an immense, wicked, kinky, bizarre, disgusting stuff in my life sexually. God set me free. I'd be an idiot not to offer that same freedom to other people. Especially when our Lord says they're in bondage, they're in darkness, and he wants to set them free from that stuff. I could give a rip when anybody says, God transforms them. You're looking at somebody who's been transformed. Now listen to me. You know, that's my, that's my hope for you, bro. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ron started the whole thing. But anyway, so. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, we're so in trouble. Hear this, right? Friends, listen to me, okay? Listen to me. That church came out of front of me saying, well, the best way to reach people for Christ is to let them know that we're, we're okay with them and what they're doing. I have never met a single person when you look at them and say, well, it's okay what you're doing, but let's see you change. Do you understand that's perverse? They're like, if it's okay, why do I need to change? Jesus declared what was wrong and then said, I can help you change. You know where we're loving? We're loving when we tell somebody, yeah, hey, look, what you're doing is wrong, but I'm going to be involved with this. I want to see you change. And I'm going to tell you that you have the power to change because God will give you that power. He's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And we just get filled with the Spirit. He's getting his precious and magnificent promises. Man, the Word and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Man, you'll change. But if you're not that, if you're Martha, you're trying to control God to control people for you because you think you know what's best for them. Parents of children that are not serving God like they need to, you think you know how to change them? You keep intervening when God's trying to do something to break them and you're intervening from God breaking them and thinking that that love will show them. You know, sometimes the loving thing you could do is get out of God's way. You know, am I making sense? Yes. You look, I'm a parent. I have the greatest, most cute, most anointed grandbaby ever. <laughs> Can I tell you something, though? God's still got to be God in their lives. Yeah. My goal in life is not to ma try to manipulate God. Do you, this is where we've gotten to. We need to be a people of the Spirit. And because we are, when the church is this and not this, people get healed. This we just have a, a great way of treating them when they send them to the hospital. <laughs> and being kind with them by their bedside as they go off into death. This prays and believes God. It gets a few people thrown out of the hospital because they're praying too loudly and tongues anointing people with oil on the way out. <gasps> but you know what? Those are the people who stand up and say, you know, man, I was in stage four and I got totally healed. I had a neighbor. <laughs> last testimony. I'm sorry. I could just keep you busy with testimonies. One of our neighbors that got saved, she had two tumors in her head. The doctors had given up on her. There was a 99% likelihood that the surgery would kill her. But she went for the surgery anyway because, you know, like, when you're desperate, you don't know anything else. You'll go for the 1%. She left to go up to Mayo Clinic. She didn't want to hear anything about Jesus. We had witnessed her, led her kids to Christ. She didn't want anything to do with Jesus. She was just happy the kids were out of the house so she, could, she and her husband could do all the illegal, immoral, ungodly things they were doing. When I found out that she was dying, she was going to go up, she wasn't going to make it through the surgery, 99% likelihood. I stood on the doorstep when it was raining. She wouldn't even let me, she didn't even open the door. She was standing with a locked, you know, uh, screen door, looking at me while I'm getting drenched. I mean, I was completely soaked. I'd asked her if I could just come inside, and she goes, no. <laughs> you know, she didn't want me there. I said, and I started crying. 
her, her name is Gabriel, you know, and Gabriela, and so I call her Gabby. I said, Gabby, please, you got to get saved. You got to get saved. Gabby, you got to get saved. I'm pleading and I'm weeping and I'm crying. You got to get saved, Gabby. You got to get saved. You know, and she says, I'm going to be fine, Dean. Do you have anything else? I've got to pack up and we're leaving tomorrow morning early. I'm pleading with her. I said, Gabby, would you at least let me pray for you? She goes, if it'll get you off my doorstep. That's literally what she said to me. Do you think she was open to anything I was saying or open to any prayer? Yes or no? Look, I'm being honest with you. You know, at times like that, look, I'm, I'm Greek, but man, it's like I got a jalapeno in my soul. I mean, I, I, if, I, if I came back, man, if I came back, if I came back, you know, if their reincarnation were true, which it's not, I would be a Jack Russell Terrier Chihuahua mix. I mean, that's me, right? <laughs> Maniacal and hyper, <laughs> right? And, and man, I mean, I, you know, part of me is like, oh God, why don't you just nail her? I mean, you know, you're always praying these prayers. Oh God, make this happen and this happen and this happen and then she'll get saved. Do I really know how to save people? God knows how to save people. I'm just doing this thing. Trying to, trying to be a person who can, who's doing what only the Holy Spirit can do. Am I making sense? My bro Chacho here, he looked at me and he said to me, man, I have you to blame. And I'm like, for what? He goes, every time I start praying, I'm just praying in tongues now. <laughs> you know what? That's what I want you to do. So that you're not praying your own made up prayers. Trying to control God. Trying to get him to do what you think is what God really wants to do, which is basically what your will is. God knows how to do it. If I can get everybody here praying in tongues an hour every day, I know revival's going to break out. I know it will. I know it will. You know how I know? In in North Dakota, it has. We were speaking at, I was speaking, I had the great privilege of speaking at a college campus. It busted out some college students, heard my challenge. They said, we've heard Pastor Dean give this challenge for a couple years. And none of us has ever done it. Some guys got together and started praying in tongues an hour every day, holding themselves accountable. Some girls found out that they were doing it. They said, we want to do it. Pretty soon it was 40 college students praying. They've been in a two and a half year revival. They have multiple, you know how churches go to multiple services? They have multiple services on their campuses to get in all the college kids that have gotten saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and healed and delivered. They're, see, they're spreading the revival to other places, sending students out that are taking over pastoring churches and leading organizations and other things around the world. It has been nonstop. The church that they're at has given the Sunday night service to all of them because it's like, hey, there's so many of you, you run the service. I mean, this is what happens if people do a simple thing. Just seek God with passion, allowing the Holy Spirit to rule and reign. Because the prayer meeting's the most important this way. Not the business meeting. Now listen to me, everybody. My neighbor, Gabrielle, I said, can I pray for you? She said, it'll get you off my doorstep. She opened, uh, I said, can, I have to put my hand on you. And so she goes, she rolled her eyes, okay. And she opened up the door a little bit. I'm literally reaching my hand around the screen door to get my hand on her shoulder. Do you realize how much this lady did not want me to do, be there? <laughs> you know what? I wasn't going to pray no, Oh God, do doth now move to show thine sinner that thou art God. <laughs> I didn't do that. You know what I did? <laughs> Hear my cry, oh God. Heal her to show you the only way to get to heaven. Keep her alive, oh God. Please don't let her go to hell in Jesus' name. Amen. Gabby Slam. That's it. <laughs> that was it. I went back. I was so dejected. I'm telling you, I was dejected. You know, you have somebody do that and you care for them, you love them. I'm bawling like a baby. My mascara was running. Hear this. <laughs> I walk out of there, right? I mean, I walk back six weeks later. My wife and I are sitting at our table eating breakfast or lunch, whatever it was, brunch, Saturday. And so all of a sudden, Carol screams. She goes, honey, somebody's pulling up. That's their car. That's Gabby. That's Gabby. She's getting out of the car. And, and, and she shouts, let's go get her. And I mean, like... <laughs> My wife's aggressively friendly. You guys would be, she's awesome. You guys would love her. I mean, we go peeling, man. I mean, we go peeling. By the way, my wife says hi. I, if I don't say that, I'm going to get in serious trouble. Carol says hi. I will say hi back. All right, so, so I mean, so I go peeling, man. I'm running. Uh, Carol's running. And I'm shouting, Gabby! And she turned around. Never done this before. She had a cute new hairstyle. Turns Six weeks later, she turns around, looks at us. She puts down the things she's carrying, and she starts crying. And she opens up her arms like this. I mean, we run up, we're bawling, she's bawling, the kids are bawling, the husband's bawling, we're all, you know, on all the rest. And all she kept saying is, your Jesus heard your prayers, your Jesus heard your prayers. I said, what happened? Come to find out, long story short, they, she got up there, they kept her there for three days because they couldn't figure out what was wrong. They literally took CAT scans, MRIs, they did all this stuff. They were looking to get the parameters of the tumor so they could do this, you know, 18-hour special surgery to see. And they couldn't find a single thing in her head except normal brain tissue. Can somebody shout amen? Then you know what? 
You may say to yourself, I don't believe this stuff. But you know what? I'll tell you what. The last Sunday I preached at that church, they've been going to that church. They've been going. They eventually moved and they're leaders in some other church. But in fact, I think they actually moved to Kansas. I think they're somewhere, you know, eastern Kansas. But, but the, the thing is, they, they became leaders at a church that they were at because they grew so much in the things of God. God knows how to do what he does. Not from this. From this. When the church is like this. You know, how many of you would admit to me you're too corporate? Come on, be honest. Too corporate. You're too stuck in your brain. Come on. You know, you, the minute you feel God tells you to do something, you get stuck in your brain. And you're like, but, but, but. Come on. We're going to get these butts out of here. Come on, amen. <laughs> right? We're going to get those butts out of here. Now, you know what? I want to ask you another question. How many of you, be honest, this is God's house. Don't lie to him in his own house. How many of you, you know, basically <laughs> have been looking to people and relying on people to do what only God the Holy Spirit can do? Right? Am I telling the truth here? Guys. A Holy Spirit people rely on the Holy Spirit. We rely that God can do what we cannot do. Look, I'm just going to be honest with you. And it's your last time here. But guys, I rely, I'm far more, I have far more confidence in my prayers than I do in my words. I bide my time and keep talking in a message until I feel like God says have an altar call. I'm far more confident with what God can do in you for these next few minutes up here than I am in anything I'll ever preach. That's where we need to get to because that's what the church is. It is a what? What is this? And it has this, which is what? But this is always the servant of this. It is never this. Don't succumb to where the spiritual body becomes a slave of this. Don't you ever go through. I'm sorry I had to use a Bible to do it. I should have used a pen. <laughs> you know, it's because he's a beauty little thing. <laughs> Let's repent.